The question for this lesson is how do you know if an object is alive? The answer, it has to have all seven characteristics of life. Not three, not five, not six of seven. You must have all seven to be considered alive. If you don't have that, you are considered non-living. So to get started, we're going to watch a quick video just kind of introducing, get you thinking about just life in general. So biology is the study of life. Bios means life, ology means the study of. So within this presentation, we're going to focus on that. What does it mean to be alive? What are the seven characteristics? What is living versus non-living? And also one of the biggest misconceptions that students have is how does dead fit into the living or non-living? First off, non-living things are abiotic. That is the official term. Anything that is non-living has never been alive, abiotic. Living things, things that are alive, that share all seven characteristics, are biotic. Even if they come from a biotic thing, like waste and whatnot, that is still a biotic factor. 
if you were a biotic factor, that means at some point the organism will die. So death is a part of life. So dead organisms are still biotic. You cannot go from biotic to abiotic. You can be one or the other. All living things show all seven characteristics. An organism is simply defined as any one individual living thing. So which is biotic, which is abiotic? The plant is biotic, the rock, abiotic. Our first characteristic, all living things are made of cells. We have three parts to a cell theory. The first part is simply all living organisms are composed of one or more cells. You know, this kind of makes sense. You have to have cells to be considered alive, which is the first characteristic. What we're going to find later on is the cell is the basic unit of life that can carry out life processes. All life begins with the cell and kind of builds up to form the organism. For some things that are unicellular, the cell is the organism. We'll get to that here later on. And then finally, all cells come from pre-existing cells. This is the notion of what's called biogenesis, that life comes from life. And we will talk about a rejected theory called spontaneous generation, where living things came from non-living things, how it was rejected and took all the support and put it toward biogenesis. If you are made of cells, you will fit into one of two categories. You will be unicellular, where you're made up of one cell, or you will be multicellular, you'll be more than one cell. If you are unicellular, you're going to be very, very small and very, very basic. And within that cell, it has to complete all organisms or all life activities within that one cell. If you are multicellular, this is when we get size, and this is when we get specialization. You have different types of cells that all do a particular job. And when you have different types of cells, this leads to complexity. Because when you're only focusing on one certain thing, you can have more than uh, what you need in terms of complexity and build up and get bigger. Whereas if you only have one cell, you can't really specialize too much because everything has to happen to keep the cell alive within that individual cell. So animals, plants, fungus, protists are all going to be multicellular. Uh, we do have some unicellular protists and you also have bacteria that are unicellular. However, majority of living things are actually unicellular. So we'll talk more about cell specialization. One of the biggest things that we mentioned early on was the idea that form fits function. Whenever you have specialization, you're going to have different structures, and those structures are going to do a specific job. For instance, in the bottom right-hand corner, you see the sperm cell. The sperm cell has a tail-like appendage called a flagella. That is to help it move. It gives it locomotion so the sperm cell can find the ovum, also known as the egg cell. We have two different general types of cells that exist. We have prokaryotic versus eukaryotic. Prokaryotic, the biggest difference, there is no nucleus in it. These are all unicellular. All prokaryotic organisms are unicellular. Eukaryotic organisms can be either unicellular or multicellular. These are going to be your plants, animals, fungi, and protists. As you can see, there is a distinctive size advantage to being eukaryotic, having that nucleus, having that brain of the cell, and we do have a more complex cell, and with eukaryotic cells, we do have that specialization that fits in with those organisms that make them bigger and smarter and things like that. So, when we look at the top left-hand corner, that is an animal cell. How we know that? Animal cells are eukaryotic, so we see that nucleus in the middle. 
We also see some special parts that we'll get into later on in the year. But more importantly, it is not a plant cell. Plant cells are usually um, rectangular in shape. And it is not a bacterial cell because it has a nucleus. Bacteria are prokaryotic. This does have a nucleus, so it is eukaryotic. In the top right-hand corner, this is a eukaryotic cell as well as unicellular. It does have a nucleus, but the entire organism is the entire organism is one cell. That is actually an amoeba. The bottom left-hand corner, we have an animal, specifically a blowfish. It is eukaryotic. It's made up of more than one cell. It's much, much more complex than the amoeba. And since it has all these different parts, is due to all the different cells. As things get bigger and bigger and bigger, the reason why it's bigger is due to an increase in cells because it is multicellular. Bottom right hand corner, that is a type of bacteria which is prokaryotic. If you notice, there is no nucleus. All of the DNA just kind of looks like a messy ball of yarn that just kind of is within the cell. There's nothing kind of containing the DNA. What type of cells are we comprised of? Well, we have so much specialization, so many different parts, so many different types of cells. We are specifically eukaryotic. The second characteristic is all living things can reproduce. Now, reproduce is not essential for the survival of one individual, but it is essential for the species. What this means is there are some organisms within the species that simply cannot have kids. If we compare this to people, there are some people, for whatever reason, men or women, that they just can't have kids. That doesn't mean that they are not a living thing. As long as different members of the human species can reproduce, that's all that matters, not just one individual. The purpose of reproduction is to pass on the DNA to a future generation and keep the species alive. You are passing the DNA from parent to offspring. We have two types of reproduction. The first type is asexual. Asexual is simply one parent splitting or budding off to form offspring. The benefits of this is you are making an exact clone, a genetically identical offspring. Bacteria, this is the only way they produce. This is called binary fission, where the cell simply splits into two. Two identical clones of what the original parent was. When we talk about mitosis later on, this is similar to mitosis, except there is no division of the nucleus, so the cell simply splits into two, and we have genetically identical offspring. The other type of reproduction is sexual reproduction. This is when you have a combination of two parents that form the first cell of the new organism. You have the egg cell, you have the sperm cell. They combine to form the first fertilized cell called the zygote. And the zygote splits and ends up forming an embryo later on. And that will keep splitting and building up to form the fetus and eventually the newborn baby. So the biggest difference between asexual and sexual is one parent versus two, and also sexual reproduction produces genetically similar organisms. Asexual produces genetically identical. When you have one parent, you're making clones. The third characteristic of life is growth and development. The difference is if you grow in size, growth in si growing in size simply means that you are increasing the number of cells that you have. Development is you are becoming more complex. If you are only a one-celled organism, unicellular, the only thing you can do is grow. If you are multicellular, you can grow because we do get taller, we do gain weight, but you also develop, you become more complex. And this is when we talked about our specialization of different types of cells. 
big things you see here, you know, the different life cycles in terms of showing complexity, whether it be a mosquito, it could be a frog, how there's different life stages where it may start from an egg and go to different intermediate stages before an adult stage. The fourth characteristic is living things obtain and use energy. Specifically, we need metabolism to maintain life. Metabolism is the combination of chemical reactions through which an organism builds up and breaks down material. Anything that our body does requires energy, and we need to break down sugar primarily to access the energy molecule called ATP to power our bodies to do every little life function possible. Without that, without obtaining and using energy, we no longer can survive. So just think of it, you know, that we need food and we need sugars and we need different uh, biomaterials to power our bodies for different actions, from blinking to making your heart beat, to walking, to talking, to sleeping, all requires energy. We have two major types of organisms. You have your autotrophs. These are going to be the ones that are your producers. They can take in sunlight through photosynthesis and make their own sugars as well as break down their own sugars. We also have heterotrophs. These are going to be your consumers and your decomposers. They cannot make their own energy molecules in the form of sugar. So they rely on consuming or decomposing other organisms to get their needed energy resources. Later on in ecology, we'll talk about food chains and food webs and how the passing of the energy resources move from one part of the food chain, food web, to the other parts. And one of the reasons why you only see a few hawks compared to more grasshoppers is there is a limited amount of energy that passes down the food chain. So your top predators, there's going to be fewer of them since there's not as much energy in the ecosystem to support them. That'll be kind of more in the spring, um, so we'll talk about that later on. The fifth characteristic is respond to the environment. So this is stimulus and response, which is kind of a uh, cause and effect relationship. So the stimulus is the signal, and the response is how the organism, um, basically, how the organism is affected by that stimulus. So, you know, how do you respond to light when you leave a dark room? You kind of probably put your hand over your eyes as you're, Eyes are adjusting to the light. How do plants respond to sunlight? This could be that they grow toward the sunlight. They could you know, open their leaves wider toward the sunlight in terms of moving to make sure that they take advantage of the sunlight as much as possible. What does the blowfish do when it's threatened? It, blow, it, fills itself, it fills itself with air to make itself look bigger. So these are simply different stimuli that occur that elicit a reaction. As you can see in the top right-hand corner, the Venus flytrap, whenever uh, the little hairs on the Venus flytrap are triggered three different times, the response is it snaps closed. It snaps closed and starts to secrete a, an enzyme to break down the flies and get nutrients. Here's an example of stimulus and response with the mimosa plant, which some of you may have seen before.
Alright, so you get the point that simply just touching those leaves elicits a response where the leaves close. So five statements and label if they are stimulus and response. The shark swims toward the direction of the smell of blood. So the smell of blood is what triggers the shark to change its behavior and swim in a different direction. Human blushes due to an embarrassing comment. So a comment is heard, and the reaction is blushing. A bat hears the flapping of wings of an insect. So what brought on a behavior change? So the insect's wings were flapping. It caused a sound. The bat can hear it. A person jerks the hand away from a hot stove. If you feel something hot, your initial reaction is to jerk it away. And then finally, a dog chasing a running rabbit. They'll see the rabbit. Rabbit starts to run. Dog starts to run. The sixth characteristic of life is called homeostasis. This is where you must respond to the environment in order to basically maintain life. So this is the ability of cells, tissues, and organisms to maintain a stable internal environment. So no matter what is happening on the outside of your body, your inside maintains stability and doesn't go to different extremes. If it goes to different extremes, that could potentially lead to death, where your body is taken away from the status quo. So sweating and shivering are examples of how your body tries to maintain that stable 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit. Dogs don't have sweat glands, so you'll hear them pant on a hot day to try to release some of that extra heat that is building up. So how is temperature regulated? Quick video to show that. Temperature is a controlled condition. It is monitored by receptors in the skin and elsewhere and they communicate changes to the hypothalamus of the brain. This control center can then coordinate the action of muscles, sweat glands, and blood vessels. These effectors can bring body temperature back to normal conditions. If, for example, body temperature were to rise, receptors would detect this increase and communicate this with the hypothalamus. The hypothalamus would then cause vasodilation of blood vessels going to the skin and the secretion of water from sweat glands to help cool the body. And this would return body temperature to normal. If body temperature were to decrease, receptors would detect this and then the hypothalamus would direct the vasoconstriction of blood vessels going to the skin so that blood would be directed deeper into the body so that heat would not be lost. 
the hypothalamus would then produce hormones, which would ultimately cause the contraction of skeletal muscle, which would generate heat and help restore body temperature to normal. Thus, homeostatic mechanisms must maintain body temperature within a narrow range. Should body temperature become too high, then a number of deleterious effects, such as the changing of the shape of proteins, would then inactivate their function. Should body temperature become too low, then many chemical reactions would not occur at rates fast enough to maintain life. And so, homeostatic mechanisms must maintain body temperature within a narrow accepted range. So, in essence, if you get too hot, your blood vessels are going to dilate because wider blood vessels mean there is more blood moving through and it's going to release heat. Your body will also secrete sweat in order to cool down the surface temperature of your skin. If you are cold, your blood vessels will constrict and kind of keep the blood closer to your core and keep that heat inside. And this is why a lot of times your, your fingertips will turn blue because a lot of the blood is, is, is kind of staying in the core. You start to shiver because shivering causes friction, which builds up heat to help maintain that core temperature. And we need to kind of keep that optimal temperature to maintain the life processes, maintain those chemical reactions that can only really occur in a small range of temperatures. So when it's cold, humans shiver. When it's hot, they sweat. Why? Because we need to keep homeostasis. We need to maintain that 98 Point six degrees Fahrenheit. And we see this whole little kind of response cycle that the body goes through to maintain that homeostasis. Very complicated uh, situation, whether it's too hot, too cold, um, temperature being probably one of the easier ones to kind of understand in regards to what's happening. So whether we shiver, whether we sweat, what's happening with our temperature, what's happening with our blood vessels to either lose heat or conserve heat. Other examples of what you see, regulation of blood sugar, as well as regulation of water balance, kind of telling yourself that you are thirsty, we need water. The seventh characteristic of life is evolutionary adaptation. An adaptation is a heritable characteristic, which means it is passed on from parent to offspring, that increases an ability to survive and reproduce in an environment. It is a trait that gives an organism an advantage to live longer. And if they live longer, they're reproducing more. And if they're reproducing more, they are passing on that beneficial trait. An adaptation has to be beneficial. If it's not, then it's simply just a small difference, a variation among the population. It must provide a benefit. Famous example, when we talk about uh, our evolution unit, will be Darwin's finches. How the finch beaks are basically customized to fit a specific food source, whether it be a hard-shelled nut, whether it be insects, um, really anything that is available on the Galapagos Islands, you know, specifically looking at one type of food. All right, thank you.